Hello? Ah. So uh, software is created by a group of people. That group of people may include commercial businesses that sponsor open source projects. Mm -hmm. There's generally an executive editor, someone who makes the decisions about who commits and what gets committed. And very importantly, the so source code is freely available to, to both use and change if you want to do it yourself. And there's many very well-known software packages that are open source, Linux, Mozilla, Apache, Android, Mongo, QGIS, et cetera, et cetera. The other um, unique characteristics are it's governed by an open license, which def defines the terms of what you can and can't do with it. And then generally, um, the software is available free of, of monetary charges. And as Richard Solomon uh, has said, um, but even though it's free, think of it more as in freedom, free speech, not as in free beer. There are, you know, as with all software, there are costs, whether it's training, whether it's deploying, et cetera, et cetera. And therein lies some of the opportunity. Um, and open source software has become big business. Um, all of the sponsors on this, uh, for this conference, are extremely important. But I've highlighted in red, you know, very large companies, billion dollar businesses that are involved in supporting open source software. And, you know, in past Phosphor G conferences, other very large companies, IBM, Digital Globe, Bing, Trimble, et cetera, have been uh, monetary sponsors of these conferences. And sort of the mother of all giant big business um, activities was the recent sale of Red Hat, whose business is open source by IBM for th 34 billion US, US dollars. So there's a lot of money around the ecosystem of open source. And I'll be talking about open source is generally, not just specifically for geo geospatial. I was at a conference um, in uh, Seattle, Washington by General Electric. And it wasn't a geospatial conference. Um, it wasn't an open source conference. It was a ut an electric utility conference. One of General Electric's biggest uh, consumer bases is um, selling software to people who run power grids, et cetera. And I was kind of surprised during their plenary session in front of the whole group in two separate slides, they go out of their way to talk about use of open source software, embracing open source technologies. And it sort of occurred to me that that's part of the point. Open source has become a good thing. It's become a standard thing that companies want to align themselves with, whether they're in the software business or not. It's viewed as get, having some credibility in the technology world if you understand and utilize open source. Um, another example of a large company that has embraced open source is Google. Um, if you go to this URL, opensource.google.com, you'll find a list of literally hundreds of open source initiatives that they host. Some of them are very large and well-known, Android, Kubernetes, the Go language, the Angular JavaScript framework. And one of the th other things they do is they support conferences, whether it's Linux conference or Phosphor-G. Um, Google has been the most consistent, largest sponsor. Um, I ran Boston. I ran the numbers. <laughs> um, and has supported every conference as gold or silver since uh, Barcelona in 2010. So there are lots of ways of support supporting open source. There are three main commerce models. And I'm going to go into a little more detail on each of them. But first is providing value-added services and support to the open source projects themselves. You know, we can all go to the gym, but sometimes you need a little extra push, a little extra help from your personal trainer to do it right, to get the exercise right. Two, leveraging or incorporating open source technologies as an ingredient to your product, sort of powered by open source, but you've created something that's commercial or that you want to um, get reimbursed for. And then third is actually open sourcing your commercial technology and leveraging it into a freemium kind of offering. So providing value to added services, it's kind of the Red Hat model, provide services that support the open source projects, help enterprises with adoption, help enterprises deploy and support the technology for the long haul. 
So, you know, again, it's free as in freedom, not as in free beer. There are costs in maintaining software, even open source software, the costs in deploying it right, the costs in improving the software when you need to. And another very important part is, and a benefit of open source software, is if something is missing, you can hire someone who knows the open source project to improve it or add the feature, and that gets done frequently. So one way of looking at it is sort of, in some models, open source is a base foundation that everyone uses, but you pay to finish it off, maybe to construct the house or maintain, maintain the building for the long run. Uh, leveraging or incorporating open source technology to deliver products. So again, you know, if your product has lots of parts, many cogs, one of your cogs may be a phosphor G component, a phosphor G project. Um, so it's kind of the notion of powered by open source. So you're basically using open source and creating value around it, or open source is helping you solve a problem, but maybe it's not all of the pieces of your problem. And it's hard to find many of the cloud products that aren't using FOSS, free and open software, in some way or another. Um, core capabilities, uh, the operating system Linux, which you know Google's power, uh, data centers are powered by Linux, so it's part of their offering. Postgres, WordPress for, for web activities. And then there's more niche capabilities like the Geo stuff, PostGIS or GDAL, et cetera. And you, know, you need to make sure that the license that you're using, the open source license, allows the commercial activity to build around it and embed and incorporate. And again, other examples, um, you know, our, our uh, platinum sponsor, Geocat, is building product powered by open source initiatives. Cardo, Mapbox, and again, the Google example of, the, of employing Linux in the data centers. And then there's open sourcing your commercial technology so basically, you build something that you may sell, but you declare that it's open source. Sometimes, and we'll talk about this a little more, it's just for, for the love of sharing what you've done. Other times, it's, it's about the money. Lowers barriers to adoption. If it's free to download and play with, it's easier to get started. And maybe you even attract contributors who like your software and help make it better over the long haul. Um, but I've been reading lately, a lot of it is about the freemium model. And uh, I took this quote from an article, uh, I'll give you the title of the article a little later. The approach is usually to develop features that you include in a basic product. Basic product is entirely free and open. And then users like it and get familiar with the free version and they start to pay for advanced features that are added above and beyond what may be in the open source base. MongoDB is an example. Um, Leaflet uh, wasn't open source by Mapbox, but they hired the main executive editor and committer, and so they continued to invest in the development of Leaflet. Um, Hadoop was open source by Yahoo, as an example. So um, in my title, it's making money, but playing by the rules. So what are the rules? And this is my take on the rules. There's no official rules anywhere, but you know, giving back and sharing is the core rule. Um, you want, should be part of the community, you should understand the licenses, you should understand how the ecosystem works. You know, nobody likes anyone who's just taking, taking, taking. Part of open source is giving back and appreciating what's been given to you. And you can give back in many ways. You can contribute code, you can contribute documentation. I was at the QGIS session, they were really um, earlier, and they were asking people, please help contribute to the documentation of QGIS, help con con um, contribute to documentation in multiple languages, etc. You can contribute your time to the, to the community. Um, for example, uh, all the work Vasily and Kadrina and the whole team are doing is a way of giving back to the open source that they, that they use as well. Um, I do that in a small way. I'm on the program committee for this conference. Or you can contribute money directly to a project or foundation or to a company that supports a phosphor g project. You can hire someone who's in the ecosystem to create a new feature. The new feature then becomes part of the open source project. So you know, don't forget, hit the support queue just button. If a thousand people contribute five dollars a year, that's five thousand dollars. 
So um, what does my company do? Again, my company, uh, Thermopylae, was bought by Hexagon in um, February of this year. And um, we do several things. And one of the things I've been doing is uh, meeting some of the other people at Hexagon who are involved in um, doing things with open source. So one thing we do is um, Google uh, deprecated uh, Google Earth Enterprise, which was a product that we resold to people, had a lot of customers. But the, instead of throwing away the code, they open sourced the code. And our company now manages that project, small community of contributors, and, and uh, we maintain the GitHub and the website. Check it out if you're interested. And we, oh, by the way, yes, we do sell an advanced version that's supported and has additional features. Um, Hexagon utilizes GeoServer and MapServer for their imagery streaming service and has contracted with companies, uh, one of the sponsors, GeoSolutions, to build some add-ons to GeoServer that are optimized for large-scale imagery streaming. And those end up in the code base. And then also um, incorporating phosphor components into professional services work. Hexagon does a lot of work with companies deploying all kinds of software, and sometimes FOSS for G tools are the right tools to do that, and it sits alongside or interfaces with commercial, commercial technology. So how do we give back? In the first case, we manage the code base. In the second base, we contribute money to people who are managing and contributing and building the code base. And in the third instance, we contribute our time in this year's case to the program committee and to supporting this conference with uh, two people attending and paying the full price. So um, here's, here's kind of the tricky part uh, and some of the lack of full definition of what it takes to, means to be giving back. So Amazon has been in the news for some of the wrong reasons with open source where there are um, companies that have the freemium model and have a free base package and then they sell the advanced features. And then this instance, uh, Cockroach Labs, uh, was concerned that Amazon might do what they've done in other situations where they've taken Elasticsearch and added their own features when there was another company that was already adding those same features. Or Apache Kafka Confluent puts add value added services on top of it. And it's sort of, you know, as the CEO of Cockroach said, there's very little protection if a company with Amazon's resources becomes dedicated to re-implementing re your in enterprise features. So they're taking open source projects that other companies have built a commerce ecosystem around, and they're just copying it and then selling it as a service. And people are taking notice. and. <laughs> Some of them, including Cockroach, are changing their license so that cloud providers can't do that. If they want to do it, it's fine, but then they should pay a license back. Uh, MongoDB is another example of this that was in the news and, um, again, you know, comes back to some things that Amazon is or isn't doing. And basically, their CEO was just brutally honest, said, we open source as a freemium strategy to drive adoption. That's why, they, that's why they did the open source. And you know, while he could have said it more nicely, people in the community appreciated the, the honesty, but it also laid open some hypocrisy about their stance against Amazon, which I'll talk about in a second. So you know, there's, there's difference in motives of why you might open source something. Um, so Yahoo open sourcing Hadoop or Facebook open so sourcing Cassandra, you know, they did it for this kind of reason. Hey, we built something that's interesting. It's not really core to what we do. So we're putting it out there and maybe people will like it. Maybe we'll get more committers and people will help improve it. Um, so in that instance, they want other people to contribute. But Mongo was different. Mongo was open sourced to drive adoption. And it's absolutely core to their business. It's not just something, one of many tools that they use. Uh, crunchy data um, is a little similar. Uh, PostgreSQL is core 
to its business, but they didn't develop PostgreSQL. They built up around it. So kind of the, the, I, the idea is if it's not core to the business, you're more likely to be interested in contributors. If it's core to the business, you might be more interested in getting consumers to use it and explore it and eventually adopt it. So it, it's complicated. And while these articles beat up on Amazon a bit, um, there's another side to the story that's good journalism. And essentially says, on the other hand, Mongo says, we don't think it's reasonable for a cloud vendor to come in and take a free version to monetize it and not give anything back. But gee, when Amazon, for example, has tried to commit to, to Mongo, they haven't been welcomed. They've been rebuffed. Mongo wants to do all the innovation itself. And that was the hypocrisy in the first quote. And then, you know, Amazon's um, defense in the, in the um, Cockroach Lab situation is um, AWS has over the years contributed to many open source projects. We are a good giving back citizen in general. Um, and in um, talking about the Elasticsearch thing, AWS in a blog said they justified the move by claiming that Elasticsearch had mixed too much proprietary software in its free software. I don't really know what that means, but they're enough on the defensive to be trying to explain what's going on. So um, before wrapping up, just want to sort of look a ahead to something that you know, landed on my uh, radar screen in, um, in Dar es Salaam, which was Facebook talking about OpenStreetMap. And it's sort of big business has been involved in open software for a long time. It's getting bigger and bigger. Now are there opportunities to commercialize um, open data or invest in open data to make the commercial products better? And Facebook is doing some interesting stuff. They're investing in making data better, largely in very populated places like Indonesia and Thailand, um, where the data was poor, but there are lots of people, lots of people who use Facebook. Um, and then they also, because they have an image to protect, uh, wanted to help uh, OSM get rid of vandalism. You know, people will create streets with nasty names. Uh, people made polygons of lakes that spelled out something uh, vulgar, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems to me to be a win-win. OSM wins with big contributions of more and better data, and Facebook wins because they're creating something that's gonna be useful to their users. So what else is coming? And you know, one of the things I heard uh, earlier this week you know, is the things Mapillary is doing in terms of getting open data from street level imagery that's starting to be a, a realistic um, alternative to Google Street View. Maybe we'll see more of that. So um, in summary, you know, free and open source commerce is alive and well and continuing to grow. There are multiple business models out there uh, to be explored and, uh, and used to grow businesses, but giving back is, is important and people should understand that and do it. But you know, as in the case with Amazon and Mongo and all those things, it starts to get complicated when large amounts of money are involved, investors are involved, venture capitalists are involved, et cetera. So there may be some further challenges ahead that will need to be navigated in this giving back arena. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, time for about uh, five minutes of questions, and then we have our five minute breakover period, and then I will uh, pass on to the next speaker. Do you have any advices for choosing <coughs> an open source license? Um, it, it's, it's not my, my oh, yeah, yeah. So, so the question was, do I have any particular advices for, for which of the multitude of open source licenses are, are, are best for a given problem? And um, it's, not my, it's not my area of expertise, so I won't try and give you advice, but there are some very important differences in, in that arena. I don't know if anyone else in the audience might be in a better position um, to answer it, but read the licenses, read the blogs about the licenses, 
and, and, and make, make, a wise, make a wise informed choice. Also, if you pick a project, understand the licenses because the license says this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. Um, you know, for example, open, open street maps license is very restrictive and has um, been controversial in certain circ circumstances. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is about business model innovation. We are all talking about the FOSS community. We talk always about the software as a product, as an innovation. Are there any uh, trends in this community about the business model innovation? How we are doing the business? By right? top of the opportunities are coming out, or we how we can modify from one product to another one, or we can sell it better way. Are there any business model innovation concept coming out? Um, you know, I haven't read anything new coming up. You know, I'm repeating sort of the, the dogma. These are the three main ones. But again, you know, the, the switch of licenses to acknowledge the power of large cloud vendors is a potential switch um, in business model. Cockroach Labs is, now sees Amazon as a potential customer. Um, and they just, they don't want to be taken advantage of. So um, it's part of why I put out what's known, and I think you're right, there's, there's opportunity for new things and uh, a lot of, certainly a lot of activity going on. We've got uh, three more minutes. Um, do you have scenarios in mind where it either doesn't make sense to open source or even is just not feasible? Or do you think that's a direction where everything can feasibly be open source? Um, the, 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 quest, the question is, um, are there, is everything going to be open sourced in the future or are there legitimate reasons to keep, keep things proprietary? Um, I go back to, to my, my house innovation. You know, people, people in commerce do have to make money some, somewhere or the other. And there are certain sort of more core things like operating systems, like databases that are very ubiquitous and it makes sense to have a couple of really good ones uh, instead of having everyone reinvent, reinvent the wheel or everyone spending huge amounts of money uh, to buy Oracle or Microsoft or, or, or whatever. Um, so I, I do think it, it makes sense and it's part of a lot of the existing business models, your question. Um, again, be, being interesting, um, that you do have your own special sauce that you're, you're selling, whether it's, it's a plug-in or an add-on or a connector to, to mobile or whatever the case may be. So I, I think there, the, um, but it is also a better way of making software. If you can attract contributors, if your users can help you improve the software, that's a, that's a huge benefit, you know, again, what Facebook did with Cassandra or, or Yahoo's done with Hadoop. Time for one more. Yes, sir. Hi, I've, I've come across clients who will stay away from open source software and they'll choose to use a proprietary one. A big example is with pedestrian products. So I'm getting clients who will want to use pedestrian because they feel that there's no Yeah. So, so the the question is, you know, Esri, the 800-pound gorilla in the geospatial um, space. Um, you know, part of me gives Esri credit. They pay a lot of attention to their customers, and most of their customers are happy. And um, although some are less happy with the, with the cost of things right now, so so part of it is to to tip tip your hat to them. The, the other part of it is to you know. I go back to General Electric, um, which is a big commercial company. Why are, they, why are they touting open source? Well, the slide on the left says, because the US Department of Defense has said it's a better, more secure product for securing net, uh, you know, electric networks. So there are, you know, tout, tout some of the benefits and also do what Esri does is continue talking to customers and as more and bigger customers adopt open source, uh, it becomes a, a, a more realistic uh, uh, alternative. Um, I have a friend who, who works in rural Tennessee with, with counties, uh, you know, and he's been, you know, one county at a time ta talking about how expensive 
um, ArcGIS desktop is and how good QGIS is and has, has made some inroads. But it's, it's shoe leather. Um, thank you, uh, and uh, good luck with the elevators. And uh, we'll start up with uh, the next talk in a minute.